Give me your time, your poor, your heart old last is turning to green, green. The wretched refuse of your teeming and I'm here with my colleague, Laura E. Cortner, today to tell you what we mean by the secret life of Lady Liberty. And it's a good thing my co-author is here with me tonight because she is the one with all the facts and figures at her fingertips. <laughs> I'm just an artist, first and foremost. And as an artist, I will be speaking to you more about the heart of the matter and why this symbol is so compelling as an artist. Laura and I are going to take turns and go back and forth for about five minutes at a time to give you some balance in our perspectives to get things started. I want to tell you a personal story. This story, or this is the story of how I became a feminist. I was raised in the 1940s and 50s to believe women were not the mental equals of men. And that was reinforced by old time radio and television, and I was a true believer in patriarchy. One of my mentors growing up was William Donald Schaefer, who eventually became the governor of Maryland. When he was running for mayor of the city of Baltimore, he faced a very tough challenge. He was going up against organized crime in that city at that time. And he asked me to help him to reach the young people by doing a poster for him. So this was 1971, and at that time, my hair was down to here, and my beard was even longer. <laughs> so. I agreed to do this design if he gave me complete freedom over what to design. Here's the poster I did for him. It shows Aquarius pouring the energies of the Aquarian age over the city of Baltimore. Now Aquarius is an androgynous being and a foreshadowing of the future of humanity. He won by a landslide, and then he went on to win the governorship. I did his uh, poster for governor as well. Now that poster helped Mayor Schaefer win the election, and afterward, he and I grew very close. And after watching him succeed against all odds, I asked him for the secrets of his success. And here's what he told me. He said, surround yourself with intelligent women. In other words, put intelligent women on your committees and you can be assured that the job will get done. Why? Because women look for compromise more than domination and winning. So surround yourself with intelligent women. I've tried to live by this motto ever since, and it has been, well, it's made all the difference in my life. Oh, it's not that. This, well, the more female goddess-type energy we can surround ourselves with, the better. 
as far as I'm concerned. Now, this is one of the secrets we learn about Lady Liberty. The strong message for women's rights hidden within their ancient symbolism. And Laura is going to tell us a little more about that. and Alice Palmasano for her patience with my many questions in organizing this. <laughs> Before I launch into my segment, I want to return to this slide here, showing Dr. Zoe Hieronymus with Dr. Bob Hieronymus in front of the Apocalypse Mural, which Hayden mentioned, to acknowledge that she could not be here with us today. She's very regretful of that, but she's busy working, finishing her own book on the white spirit animals of prophecy. She's become so psychically sensitive that being in crowds is difficult for her. So a trip to New York City right before Christmas was a bit overwhelming. But she is represented here by her daughters. We have Marie Hieronymus and Anna Hieronymus and her wife, oh. Elise Kornack. <laughs> right on. Very glad that you're here. Um, so I also want to point out that in this we have the Statue of Liberty going down in flames. This is one of the many symbols in this mural that is 2,700 square feet large. and packed full of symbolic messages. It's a huge mural painted all by hand by Bob in 68, 69. And we have a whole book about it if anybody's interested in learning more about it. Now, I'm going to tell you what surprised me the most as we researched this book on the Statue of Liberty. And it started when we tackled the question of why is liberty depicted as a woman in a land where women had no liberty? The history of the Statue of Liberty, it turns out, is bookended by the histories of these, these women, especially from the 20th century, very creative, strong, brave women who changed the course of history, especially these women who pushed through the 19th Amendment. They gave women a whole new elevated status level. And when I learned their personal histories, I realized how much of the women's movement was not completed yet, and that I was part of that. I, I came of age in the 70s and 80s, and we were conditioned to believe that the women's movement was over, and we girls could be anything we wanted to be. I remember when Barbie became an astronaut. I didn't identify with the word feminist, but it was the Statue of Liberty that taught me I need to embrace that label and tell other people that this is a cause that's worth fighting for, that, that this, the liberty for women is essential for humanity's progress on this planet. What attracted us to study these, the early suffragists of the 20th century, was their successful use of symbolism. They chose symbols to identify themselves that resonated with the American tradition. And that gave them a sense of, gave their movement a sense of authority, and it also made their opposition feel less threatened. Since the founding of our republic, Americans have chosen the allegorical female to stand for the so-called women's strengths of caregiving, nurturing, protecting the young, enlightenment. This photo is from over here is from the 1913 <coughs> suffrage parade in Washington, DC. That's Inez Milholland, a name you should all know. Look her up, she has a fascinating story. She was a lawyer. She led the parades dressed as what they called the Herald. It became the motto of the National Women's Party. And over here we have Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet, her own organization. This is the Herald Awakening New York City broadside from one of her publications. Here we have the Joan of Arc enlisted in the suffrage movement and the light symbolism, just like in the Statue of Liberty underneath the votes for women, their motto is forward into light. This is another woman dressed this time exactly as the Statue of Liberty 1916 suffrage parade in St. Louis. We don't know her name because the caption identifies her only as an extension of her husband's property. She's Mrs. David O'Neill. This is something that the women of the 1970s were fighting against, one of the social norms. This is their 1970 takeover of the Statue of Liberty. They were trying to draw attention to the strike for women's equality. And they hung a 40-foot banner here on the bottom of the pedestal that said, Women of the World Unite. Hmm. And the media attention drew out 5,000 people two weeks later that marched down Fifth Avenue far more than they had expected. The other banner attracted them to the day and the time. They saw Liberty, Lady Liberty, that day as a powerful supporter of their cause. 
Uh, fast forwarding up to today, some editorial cartoons to show how the Statue of Liberty is an energizing symbol. She's generally used as the conscience of our nation or as whispering into Uncle Sam's ear when the U.S. is taking on a more militaristic, materialistic point of view. Joel Pett is one of our favorites. He often pairs them as a domestic couple to show two sides of the argument. Or look at these recent ones with our president-elect <laughs> violating the Statue of Liberty. In these scenes, she stands for us, and we feel violated. Hollywood has also discovered how effective it is to destroy the Statue of Liberty. They almost seem to be coming up with more and more creative ways and competing with each other on how to destroy her. She's frozen over in the day after tomorrow. She gets her head chopped off with polar fields. She's, of course, Destroyed by aliens in Independence Day. She even makes an appearance in Sharknado 2. I like that. And no, you can't forget the iconic scene at the end of the Planet of the Apes when Charlton Heston realizes he's been on Earth the whole time when he sees the decaying Statue of Liberty. My God, what have we done? So most everyone around the world associates the Statue of Liberty with the self-identity of, Amer of Americans. You noticed your own visceral reaction when you saw her being violated in those cartoons. It's because <laughs> We identify with her as our mom, or as one of us, so when she's being beaten up, we feel it. Our book is all about seeing the Statue of Liberty as a powerful goddess, and doing so has led us to the conclusion that liberty for women is essential for survival. In fact, there's a direct correlation with how you treat your women and how you treat your world. The sacred feminine is at the very foundation of this nation, and we want you to remember that as this new administration attempts to roll back much of the legislation that's been put in place in the last two decades, several decades, to protect women's rights. So whenever you see the Statue of Liberty, remember that the goddess energy inside her is one of her secrets. And it's the goddess energy that impels us towards cooperation and partnership. And Bob's going to break down some of her symbolism now to show you how the Statue of Liberty is all about balance. That's right, the Statue of Liberty is all about balance. Internal and external balance. And by that, we mean both balance inside us each of us, and as male, female humans, as well as balance outside, encouraging partnership over domination. Before we analyze her individual symbols, just a few words on the importance of symbols to a healthy nation especially. This is based on my doctoral thesis and my dissertations which is an analysis of American symbols from humanistic and transpersonal psychology. That point of view. Symbols and archetypes are significant forces in the psyche. They speak to our subconscious and thus are far more effective at motivating people's emotions than words are. They are a bridge between the conscious and unconscious mind. They cultivate wholeness, resulting in self-realization. Now, our failure to create meaningful myths and symbols to, in today's society has led to our disintegrative state. Let's take a look at the symbol of the torch. The torch is in her right hand. The hand of activity and her action is enlightening the world. A little later on, you'll be amazed at how many Statue of Liberties there are in other countries. I bet you won't be able to guess. The torch in our right hand is symbolic of her action. She is actively leading the way with her torch held high, enlightening the world, not just the United States, but the world. The right hand is the more favored position in heraldry, and Laboulaye, the father of the Statue of Liberty, said, it's not the torch that sets a fire, but the flambeau, the candle flame that enlightens. The Age of Enlightenment birthed the American Republic. The torch is a symbol of light. 
And according to the scriptures, the first thing God did after creating heavens and earth was let there be light. The Statue of Liberty's light symbolism equals elevated consciousness, opening up to the spiritual world, accomplishing spiritual vision. It is the Holy Spirit shining through her or the purification through elimination or truth. That's her right hand. What about her left hand? Because we're talking about balance here. The tablet in her left hand, the left hand is the hand of passivity or contemplation. And the object held in the left hand is being nurtured. It's like the Statue of Liberty's baby. The tablet symbolizes the law of the Republic and the birth date of the nation, July 4th, 1776. And the goddess is cradling it, it's nurturing it, it's protecting it, and that is our independence. Again, it's like her child. The radiant crown. The rays of light from her crown mean her enlightened inner being is in balance. Carl Jung, one of my favorites, Carl Jung, never met him, said, the highest goal of evolution is the crown of eternal life. And the crown is a symbol of victory of the higher aspirations over the lower, baser nature of instincts. It is spiritual enlightenment evolving from ignorance to wisdom. In the Hebrew Kabbalah, the crown or keter is the top sephiroth holding light. It is the source of all life. A glow occurs in moments of mental and emotional and spiritual oneness and it rose to limitless light or ein sof. Now, there's a hidden symbol on the Statue of Liberty. It is the chains. The chains are under her foot, and they symbolize both <coughs> slavery and the chains that bind us to the material world. Chains are beneath her feet to show that liberty crushes tyranny. We're going to need that for the next four years. Chains were formerly held in Liberty's hand and were replaced by the Book of Law. The chains were also used to be a symbol of union, according to Uncle Ben Franklin, who did not know how to treat women at all, as much as I love this. Just study his life with his wife that he didn't see for 14 years. In the Statue of Liberty, chains stand for bondage of religious and political oppression. This Lady Liberty means that America, in America, we have the freedom to choose mentally and spiritually. That's going to be challenged. The revolutionary generation designed a government of freedom of choice. They were against the monoculture of the earlier Puritans. Check out your history on the earlier Puritans. How many children were murdered during that particular time? How many women were murdered during that time? Then there is the Statue of Liberty's androgynous face. Can you tell really if that's a male or a female? Some thought, of course, it was inspired by uh, his mother. And some say, no, nope. it was Edward Laboulet. They're both similar. But conscious androgyny is the goal, and it is the future of us on this planet. The need for parity both inside our conscious personalities of the male-female balance. I'm about 51% male and about 49% female. And we all are some similar pattern like that. So, so gender parity 
is equals numbers of male, female, and power. Now, Lars is going to tell us about another of the secrets of Lady Liberty, and that is her Native American heritage. I guess you can tell this is a Statue of Liberty book unlike any other Statue of Liberty <laughs> book out there. It's our intention, actually, that you'll never look at the Statue of Liberty in quite the same way again. Now, here's another one of her secrets. She has Native American ancestry. From the earliest days of contact, the European artists devised this fourth allegorical female to stand for the new land that they had discovered. They already had allegorical females for Europe, Asia, and Africa, and they had to design a new one when they discovered there was a whole other part of the world. She's allegedly a Native American woman, although she doesn't really look like one. In fact, all of their facial features are very much <laughs> European. The only way you can usually tell America from the others is that she's partially or entirely naked. There was no attempt at authenticity, in other words, but she's available, in other words. This figure is sometimes called the Indian Queen, although that's a complete misnomer as well because Indian just repeats Columbus's mistake. And Queen, well, there was no royalty amongst the Native Americans, at least not in the northern part of the Americas. Learning more about her forced us to reconcile our treatment of the Native Americans with their contribution to our concept of both liberty and lady liberty. The Indian Queen and the later Indian Princess were both used specifically as propaganda. They shaped Euro-Americans' opinions of the indigenous people on this continent. Like the Statue of Liberty, the Indian Queen is strong and fierce, yet still very much a woman with all the caregiving, nurturing qualities that comes with that symbol of a woman. Here she is riding on an enormous armadillo, apparently drawn by somebody who'd never seen an armadillo in real life, but had heard reports of this unusual animal in the new world. She's carrying an axe and a bow, and in the background there are scenes of cannibalism, also very common. There's sometimes a severed head nearby. She stands for both the territory and the women who lived here. You see these, these images a lot in the travel literature of the day, and in there, the land is often described as virginal and waiting to be ravished. And the women are described, here's a quote from Vespucci, very desirous of copulating with us Christians. <laughs> this is actually Vespucci in this, in this image of America being discovered. She, she's being awoken from her slumber here. She's mostly naked, obviously wearing a little feathered skirt here. He's standing here fully clothed with his scientific astrolabe. So in this one picture, we have the male about to dominate the female, Europe about to dominate America, and science about to dominate nature. Here she is as late as 1733. She's often seen in the cartouches of maps, and her head, her feet are, are resting on a severed head with an arrow through it, and an alligator. Around 1765, the English colonists designed a new Native American woman to stand for them. This is often called the Indian Princess. The voluptuous Indian Queen has slipped down. She's more athletic now, more paler skin. Here she is seen engaging in fisticuffs with an image standing for Great Britain. So the Indian Princess was used quite successfully to help rally the rebellion, the, the pay the other people in the country. To, to break away from the mother country that had been symbolized by another allegorical female, the armored Britannia. The Patriots put the Indian princess everywhere. This is on a, on a masthead for the Massachusetts spy that we blew up over here. She's got a tobacco leaf skirt carrying the pole and cap of, of the Roman goddess Libertas. This is a Paul Revere design in honor of the repeal of the Stamp Act. And in, in several of the panels, you have the Indian princess standing for America over here. She's being counseled by a liberty goddess with the pole and cap. For some reason, she's got wings over here, telling her what to do about the evil ministers of King George. And in the final panel, here's Liberty with her pole and her cap, counseling King George about what to do about this America over here. In the very first diplomatic medals that the new Americans devised, they, they depicted themselves as a Native American woman. And this one, Thomas Jefferson has some input in this. She's wearing her feathers, holding a cornucopia, greeting the god Mercury to show that this land would be abundant with merchant activity and agriculture. And over here, she's got her feathers, holding the laurel wreath of, of victory over the Revolutionary War hero Daniel Morgan. 
As soon as the Revolutionary War was won, however, the Indian princess starts to wane in popularity almost immediately because it was hard for them to reconcile the fact the depicting themselves as a Native American when the explosion in popularity of the settlers just pushed through the territory and broke every treaty that they had made to protect the Indian lands. So this is when you begin to see the Indian princess donning Roman robes and transforming into the more Euro-American concept that we're more familiar with, the Lady Liberty that influenced the Statue of Liberty. You see her here with Benjamin Franklin also in Roman attire and surrounded by a bunch of other goddesses. Here's Liberty with her Poland cap. And over here, she's still darker skinned with the feathers, but she's wearing the Roman robes and the sandals that looks classically Roman. Soon, the feathers in her hair are completely replaced by ostrich feathers, which is what the contemporary women of fashion were wearing. And by the War of 1812, she's wearing the empire waisted dresses and looking very contemporary. So what did we learn from studying the Native American, the Indian queen, the Indian princess, that there's a vast difference in the appreciation of both liberty and women in these two cultures. And this difference can be summed up in a quote from a Cherokee leader from 1759 that he said to his European counterparts over the council fire, where are your women? They were shocked that the Europeans didn't bring their women to these councils to decide when to have peace and when to have war because they had relied for centuries on their women to make that most important decision for them. The Europeans were equally as shocked at the question because they would never consider that. They had been brought up to believe that women were inferior to men and responsible for the fall. They were morally inferior and not to be trusted, so they would never bring their women along to a diplomatic discussion. It all starts with what kind of creation stories you're taught. If you're taught that your creator gods are a gendered pair, or that your goddess is the earth in which you walk, then you tend to structure your society as a gendered partnership rather than a gendered hierarchy. And you tend to have more reverence for the earth and everything that walks on it. The Iroquois, for example, had their women in high esteem. And the Council of the Clan Mothers, when you compare the two structures of government, the patriots borrowed a lot from the Iroquois, except for this part. The Council of the Clan Mothers would be on par with the Supreme Court. They made all the most important decisions. Their strengths were seen as different from men, but equally powerful. So the Patriots didn't pick this up because we don't know why. Maybe they should just they could just handle one revolution at a time. But by the mid-1800s, these women were ready for that next revolution. And women like Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, names we should all know, decided to look around and see if there were other societies structured differently than what they had been brought up with. And they found one basically in their own backyard in upstate New York. The Iroquois were very much, a, a, still a very much a force up there. And the Iroquois women provided a great role model for these pioneering women that launched the women's movement. And that's where Bob's gonna pick it up and tell us more about how the Native Americans, particularly the Iroquois, encouraged us to become Americans. Up until then, we had just thought of ourselves as English men and women living abroad. Okay, I'm gonna try to talk about stuff that's banned from television. Of the hundreds of shows I've done on the history, Discovery, National Geographic, BBC, and many others, I've never been allowed to talk about the League of the Iroquois and their influence upon the Founding Fathers. Why? Because I have to tell you, and you probably already guessed, that men basically are in charge of all of those, that program. That's right, we're talking about the influence theory here. The influence theory explains why representational democracy sprung up only in the northeastern part of the English colonies in the Americas, and in all the other colonies of Great Britain and around the world, and in all the colonies of France and Spain and elsewhere, everyone was reading the same books talking about enlightenment, the enlightenment philosophy. But a representational republic did not appear anywhere else in the world because they all lacked the essential ingredient of our founders that they had here in the Northeast, the model 
of the League of the Iroquois, established, listen to this, 1142 A.D. There was a republic for hundreds of years here, established in America, long before Columbus got here and destroyed a few things. The most convincing evidence that our founding fathers were influenced by the Native Americans is in the words of the founders themselves. A guy like John Adams. Remember the John Adams special? Did they talk about this? No way. John Adams wrote that the United States Constitution was the Americans' attempt to set up a government of modern Indians. Have you ever heard that before? You should have. Thomas Paine wrote, to understand what the state of society ought to be, it is necessary to have some idea of the natural state of man, such as it is at this day among only the Indians of North America. Poverty, they say, was a creation of what is called civilized life, and it exists not in the natural state. Now, during the controversy in May and June of 1776 over whether or not to declare independence, the Second Continental Congress invited 21 Iroquois sachems to observe the debates. I'm sure you've heard about this, right? The Indians camped out in the room above Congress on the second floor. They lived there. And their advice is recorded in the congressional record. Why aren't historians ever discussing this? This tree shows our three basic branches of government as they compare to the Iroquois structure. And I'm going to read you here an abbreviated list of other principles that the framers of the United States Constitution adopted directly from the Iroquois. The people had the right to impeach their leaders. That would be very handy about them. They united several sovereign nations to act as a unit. That's the United States of America. They prohibited military leaders from becoming political leaders. That's beginning to change here. A critical change for, from European tradition. And most importantly to tonight's discussion, they created a set of electors who voted for the leader, and they decided it was best for women to be these electors in charge of voting for the chiefs. They voted in the chiefs. They voted in the leaders. Now it is clear that the balance built into the Iroquois system for long-term peace was the voice of the clan mothers. The goal of gender partnership reminds me of my dear old friend Carl Jung, who I never met, <laughs> talking about conscious androgyny. Have you read his red book yet? It's over 10 years old. What a book! It'll blow you away. He was an alchemist. If he would have. Oh, just can't get that. <laughs> No, there's no time. <laughs> America experienced a burst of this partnership energy back in 1969, in the summer of 1969, when about a half a million people shared peace and love in a partnership society for three days. The Woodstock Nation is going to rise again, as foretold on my Woodstock bus. Seen here in the Associated Press photo, it's been so many times in the New York Times and they've never told you who did it. I don't know why that is. And uh, on the right is the diecast model made of this bus showing the rear, which I painted, she is coming. This refers to the androgynous nature of the divine soul within and also to the coming of the Aquarian age. One of the reasons I drew Aquarius in the campaign poster for Mayor William Donald Schaefer is because Aquarius is an androgynous being. The age of Aquarius is still dawning. We haven't even got to it yet. And with this new election, we are currently experiencing a pendulum swing back towards 
the dark ages of separation and control. And it will be interesting to see how the 50th anniversary of Woodstock in 2019 will play out in this new administration that doesn't seem to be in harmony with the urge to celebrate peace and love again. I'm working with several new documentary companies who want to recreate this Woodstock bus that I did in 1968, this time with a Tesla engine installed and drive it across the country on a goodwill tour, then donate it to the museum. Of course, they're also going to take it to Europe. You know, Woodstock is bigger in Europe than it is in the United States. Mm. They look at it, Woodstock as being our growing up. They were applauding Woodstock because of that. I'm sorry, I can't spend time on that. But now, let's bring this all back home to the Statue of Liberty once again. Did you know there are replicas of the Statue of Liberty in over 25 countries? Replicas of the Statue of Liberty are inspiring people in Argentina, Australia, Austria, Brazil, China, Ecuador, France, Germany, India, Ireland, Israel, Japan, Malaysia, Kosovo, Mexico, Norway, Pakistan, Peru, the Philippines, Singapore, Spain, Taiwan, Ukraine, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam. There is no Statue of Liberty in Russia. Does that tell you something? I think so. That's not going to surprise you. The Boy Scouts of the 1950s made sure that at least one replica of the Statue of Liberty was in every state of the Union. God bless those guys. The people of France have several, including the most famous reproduction, which is just down the same from the Eiffel Tower. Now this symbol speaks to people around the world. It's, as I said before, it is a world symbol. It's their best symbol that we've had in this country influencing the world. That is why she is a symbol for the future of women and men worldwide. Now, Laura is going to show us some of the ways the Statue of Liberty has been used in propaganda, and then we're going to wrap it up. We like to say that the Statue of Liberty, or rather the American Liberty Goddess, filled the role of the mother goddess in our new nation. She has been used to represent just about every political campaign, all kinds of opposing causes and protests. Ever since she was used in the Liberty Bond campaign to raise money for World War I, the Statue of Liberty has taken over the role of the American Liberty Goddess. And you rarely hear about Columbia anymore, very popular in the 1800s or the Indian princess. You basically see her vote on, on tobacco advertisements, and that's the only place we see her anymore. We have a whole, a whole chapter in our book on the Black Statue of Liberty to address the different approach and resonance that black Americans had with this statue, having their ancestors mostly brought over from another country as someone else's property, ought to pay for, rather than as immigrants or indentured servants looking for a better life or for liberty. This political cartoon is from a 1906 paper of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and that was during the era of many indiscriminate lynchings. And this crime actually occurred where three black men were hauled out of jail and hung underneath a replica of the Statue of Liberty in Springfield, Missouri. During the Civil War, both sides, the Union and the, and the rebels, both claimed liberty as their mascot. They both thought they were fighting for liberty in their own way. During the 1880s, when the fundraising was at full force in this country, many African Americans did support the fundraising, while others wrote scathing editorials about how it was a hypocrisy and liberty was reserved only for the elite in this country. Today, we associate her with immigration, but from the beginning, she's also been used by those who are anti-immigration. That's a a political cartoon from 1885, before the statue even went up, and some more modern day cartoonists showing her anti-immigration. She's hollow. People will fill her up with whatever concept of liberty appeals to them. Many people travel to the Statue of Liberty to protest. Here's the famous Bob Bruin photo of John Lennon in 1974. 
where he was fighting deportation for his anti-war activities. And here's two more staged protests with the Vietnam veterans against the war and Puerto Rican nationalists who both briefly took over the statue to draw attention to their cause, all kinds of causes, every side of every argument. Her success as an archetype is revealed in how quickly and completely she's been adopted by advertisers, again, before she was even officially unveiled. This cartoon is from 1885, showing her plastered with advertisements. From the very beginning, she'd been merchandised out. Um, one of her earlier advertisements selling whiskey, here she's wearing Levi's, and of course, the ultimate honor, she becomes a Barbie doll. And finally, this uh, is a couple of the slides we found on the internet of tattoos, just again to show the different kinds of people that find her appealing. So Bob has a few more thoughts on how we can use this new appreciation of the Statue of Liberty as America's goddess. Well, this is a slide showing our other giant Statue of Liberty in the United States and her story, which we don't have time to tell you about right now, is one of compromise. She's called the Statue of Freedom and she's on top of the Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C. And many people mistakenly think that she is a Native American woman. Now, I've been painting murals for the city of Baltimore since the 60s and my work in public gave me a unique insight into the challenges faced by both the sculptor of the Statue of Freedom, Thomas Crawford, and the sculptor of the Statue of Liberty, Auguste Boltoldi. Some of the troubles all public artists experience in common include, and this is not going to surprise you at all, being controlled by bureaucrats who know nothing about art. Noise and dirt and disruption from the public as you're trying to work in public spaces and everyone's asking you when you're going to be finished. The lack of funding. I can't tell you how many times I have had to work for no compensation on a city project when the budget ran out before the project was complete. And of course, that's what happened to the Statue of Liberty. The budget ran out a couple of times. As many with public art projects that are large in scale. The success or failure comes down to your ability to physically outlast your project. It takes years off your life. It does. When I think of the Statue of Liberty, I think of helping other people. There was a time I was a poor and starving artist and I was troubled over how I could help the homeless of those less fortunate than I was even when I had no money and here's what I did. Now I taught this to my children. Will my children stand up? Yes, Anna and Mare. Uh, I said to them, this is what we did. Send people light. Visualize them immersed in blue and green. See them whole and happy. It helps. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs you time. And you got to be careful because if they're watching you, watching them, Strange things can happen. And there are three practices that work for me to find inner balance. They are prayer, talking to the deity or your higher self. Two, meditation, listening to the deity or your higher self. And three, and probably more important than both of those, is service to others. Look around you, especially to the elderly, and see how they're doing. It doesn't take much to help them. It's really important, especially with what is coming our way in the years to come. We are ignoring Mother Nature's warnings, and we're going to pay for it heavily. So, 
you've got any time, look out for others. Now, Laura is going to conclude our talk, and then we can take some questions. message to you is that we want you to start noticing the goddesses all around you. For example, the Liberty goddess was the only image on our coinage up until the 20th century when the president's heads took her place. You'll see her all over Washington, D.C., of course, in the public buildings in Philadelphia, here in New York City, just about anywhere you look, in, in this building <laughs> included. We added this slide in acknowledgement of where we're speaking tonight, the Samuel Tilden Mansion because this is the night of the 1876 presidential poster for Samuel Tilden, and here you see Liberty with her hat, and here is Victory with her wreaths, and this is Columbia in the red, white, and blue, and this detail over here, we blew it up a little bit, it's still a little fuzzy, is a Temple of Liberty. There's a group of people dancing around the Temple of Liberty. It was a very common motif of the day. Our revolutionary generation put goddesses everywhere. This is just a few of the over a dozen state seals and state flags that feature goddesses, mostly Liberty, but we also have Minerva making frequent appearances and Ceres, the goddess of prosperity or the earth. So start noticing these American goddesses all around you and you will start noticing the goddess manifesting in your daily life as well. You'll see the female divine in expressions of caregiving and nurturing from both men and women. You'll see the life-giving cycles of nature, the birth, the death, rebirth. The action in her formal name, which is liberty enlightening the world, reminds us that action is required to defend the liberties, but also to try to attain these high ideals set for us by our founders in these words and in these symbols. They really believed that a virtuous citizenry was required to fill this utopia that they were writing about. So we end on a note of suggesting that you volunteer actively for whatever cause you feel will make the world more whole. Mentor young girls to become leaders and support policy shifts toward caregiving in business and in politics. Anything that helps both men and women take care of their families because the family is where it starts. Caregiving and nurturing are at the heart of success for a country and a nation. When you rebrand the Statue of Liberty as America's goddess, when you acknowledge the divine female as part of our American tradition, it helps you remember that life is sacred and we all have a responsibility to one another to keep it that way. The Statue of Liberty is the female half of our nation's conscience. And as such, she's all about finding balance. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Absolutely. Any questions? Give me your time. 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 Give me your